welcome to DBF at Home. It's lovely to be with you today. Um, congratulations on the book, which I have strategically placed here. Um, it was Radio 4 Book of the Week and uh, Daily Telegraph Book of the Year. Um, am I right in thinking that the book was commissioned before The Guardian broke what became the Windrush scandal? Yes, the book was commissioned approximately two years before that scandal arose and was reported on by Amelia Gentleman in The Guardian. Um, it, this is not a new subject to you um, because you have written a memoir of your parents coming here from Jamaica um, in the 70s. Um, what's really important to me that I get out of the book is a sense of Britishness amongst the Windrush generation. And I wonder if you could start by putting that into context for us. Yes, so my parents are both from Jamaica, as you say, Vicky. Um, in the 1940s, when they were growing up in Jamaica, if you were to go to the cinema, for instance, before the film began, you would stand up and sing the British National Anthem. At the end of the screening, you'd also stand up and sing the British National Anthem. My mother was schooled in British literature. And so when she was sweeping in Luton, where I'm from, in the 60s and 70s, she would be reciting Gunga Ding. She knew all of Kipling. She knew all the romantic poets. So everything was geared towards Britain. Britain was the prison through which they saw and acted out their lives. And that was true even of the things that were brought into the island. All the leather goods were British, all the clothes were British, the cars were British. Um, so uh, their sense of their own history was limited. Their sense of their attachment and their history through Britain was what they believed themselves to be. So many people, uh, whom I interviewed for the book, also talked about the fact that their real understanding of British culture came up through watching Ealing comedies. So they were very familiar with Hattie Jakes and Sid James and Alice Sims. Um, so if you can imagine, when they came to England from the Caribbean, it was like an internal migration. It was the equivalent of someone coming from Manchester to London, as far as they were concerned. And you have this lovely recurring theme of coats throughout the book. Perhaps you could share with us why coats are so important. Well, how you dress is very important to the Caribbean people. I'm sure many people who are watching this and hearing this will be familiar with some of the images from the Windrush ship that came and those fantastic, lovely photographs of men primarily wearing these fedora hats and these zoot suits and the heavy coats. Um, there was no tradition in the Caribbean of wearing fedora hats. They bought those kind of clothes to present themselves in a certain way that had a certain kind of charm and grace and erudition. Um, and when you lived in the Caribbean, there was no real reason to have a heavy coat. So many of the people who came, um, if they didn't have a coat, they would struggle. And in the course of researching the, the book and interviewing people from Luton as well, where, where I grew up, um, I talked to my mother about a man who was called Summerware. Um, and he was called Summerware because he, when he came to this country from Jamaica in the late 50s, early 60s, he insisted on wearing light summer suits, tropical suits, no matter the weather. Um, and that was his name. He had to live to that name. And I asked my mom whatever became of Summerware. And she said, well, within a few months, he caught a chill and died. It's a bit sad, but actually, she said it without any humor, but she said it in her own phlegmatic way. Um, and the understanding was that um, if you were somewhere, there's no way you could uh, act against your name. You had to uh, embrace your name and only wear light suits. So yeah, clothes and heavy clothes were something that were unfamiliar to them. And if you didn't prepare properly, you might struggle. I mean, that leads me on in, in, in many different directions um, uh, it, within the book. But one is just that sense of humor. I mean, I don't want to, there, there is, great sadness, uh, there's, a, uh, there's an anger in this book, but there is just the most astonishing sense of humour. Um, could you just kind of describe that kind of West Indian sensibility? Yeah, yeah well, I think they had a great sense of humour and they took things on the chin, but also, Vicky, there was a great allure about coming to Britain. They'd been familiar with these names like Oxford Circus, Trafalgar Square, these 
were romantic names and they were in the abstract. So the idea of coming to England and to see these things you've only read about or heard about was very um, enlivening. And so there's a man called um, Wallace Collins who talks about the fact that when he came to the UK, he wanted to take pictures of himself and send them back home to say that he's arrived and he's now living the life. And he goes to Trafalgar Square and he says in this letter home, um, at a, I went to the square and a pigeon came and dropped something on my head. And he wrote back to his family, I am making history, uh, which I really loved. Uh, but also they took um, knocks on the chin and they pulled up the collars of their coats when they were subject to transgressions. Um, and that humour helped them. So for instance, there would be many occasions where people would um, apply for jobs um, only to get to the interview and be told that they're too late, that the position had already gone. And there was a man called Mr. Johnson who said to me, um, oh, the English man is the nicest man in the world when he's telling you no. So they didn't embrace any kind of uh, slights. They expelled them through humour again and again. And I love that. And there's a, you, you have a chapter heading and it's actually, um, it's actually rather a funny advertisement and it's Take Courage. Um, could you explain that advertisement and how that was understood by this community coming to Britain? Well, that was told to me by a man called George Mangar, who's from British Guyana. And at the time when he was growing up in the 40s and 50s, there was only one train line that went from A to B in a straight line, more or less, through the country. Um, and when he came to uh, England, the first thing that he did was to get on the underground. He went, um, came into uh, Victoria and he was going to go to Liverpool Street and got on the underground and, and he didn't know when to get off because the train never seemed to come to an end. It went round and round. And he was on that underground for about three hours um, before he realised that it was a circular line. And he, anyway, he gets off the train and he... he um, Two things happen to him. He goes to Liverpool, he goes to um, Liverpool Street Station, and he sees all these people uh, running. And in the Caribbean, he says that whenever you saw someone running, they were either running out of the rain, or they were a thief. And eventually, when he gets to his destination, he said that he saw these people running. He didn't realize that there's so many thieves in London. And his uh, the friend who greets him says, "Well, they were commuters. They weren't thieves." But on the way to meet his friend, when the train leads to Liverpool Street, he passes again and again on the sides of buildings. This advert um, says, take courage. And he thinks it's speaking directly to him, that he should take courage and steal himself to this great adventure that he's on, not realising it's an advert for some beer. I mean, that, that's a bit, I have to say, that stuck with me, the idea of people running in Oxford Street. Um, there is both laugh out loud humour in this book. There's an absolute charm to it, but there that we, I can't I can't gloss over the heartbreak. And you've you've mentioned work, and I feel that that's that's something where I gosh I hope we have come an awfully long way to the uh, from those experiences. Perhaps could you just discuss with us um, something around that? Well, yeah, I mean there were many hardships and there were many slights. One of the biggest was around the difficulty of finding accommodation. And many people that I spoke to talked about the fact that they all had similar experiences. And this is uh, new to me, because you, growing up in the 60s and 70s, you might hear these stories occasionally. But when I was composing this book, I was hearing them again and again and again. And you realize that the story that you've been told is almost like a universal story. And so uh, there was one woman called Waveney Bushnell, who's also from British Guyana. And she said that you would see when you wanted to get a, a flat somewhere, you'd see these little adverts in the sh shop windows, sometimes in the house as well. And the, the, the little adverts also had these little warnings, little signs. And the sign said, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And Waveney Bushels said that these signs are so prevalent that she would bring up or write to the prospective landlord and advise the landlord that she was black, just so they wouldn't waste each other's time because of these many rejections. And she says to me, when I interviewed her a couple of years ago, she said that till today, more than 50 years later, 
she can't walk up the path, climb the steps and knock on the front door of a stranger's house if she feels that a white person will open the door because the rejection has been so deep, it's buried in her and it's never really been fully resolved. So those kinds of uh, humiliations, those daily humiliations, I didn't realize the degree to which they had to be withstood in some way. And sometimes they, they, the approach was just to be stoic and, and not address it whatsoever. One of the joys of a book um, like yours is that there are repeated voices through the book. You obviously um, interviewed an enormous number of, how, how many people did you interview? Well, I interviewed at least 60 people myself. Um, and then I used some archive from the BBC, the British Library, and some friends and associates who had their own personal archive. But yeah, we, we, there was a way of structuring the book so that these voices uh, are, are, are strung like, like beads on a thread throughout the book. And so they pop up again and again. So you, you become familiar with these returning characters. That's the idea. And, and, and Waveney, uh, Waveney Bishop is one of my, my favourites and because she does personify that idea of a very a, a British voice. Um, she's, she's named after a Norfolk river. Yes. Um, it made me laugh because she's from Buxton, but it's Buxton and Demerara in British Guyana. And yeah. so she, she kind of personifies that, that kind of sense of, of, of Britishness amongst this crew. But one of the, and, and one of the voices is your mother. Is, yes. is your mother's voice and recollection. But one of my absolute favorites, and I just love when he speaks, is, is, a, is a gentleman called Bert Williams. Yes. And I yes. wonder if you could talk to us about Bert. Yes, Bert is a man who now lives in Brighton, where I live. And he's, again, Jamaican. And he typifies the way that people are very lyrical and poetic in the way that they speak. And one of the slight difficulties I had with many of the people that I interviewed was that they weren't really, uh, and they didn't really understand the degree which they spoke poetically. Um, and I made a, a pact with them that I would show them the transcripts before we published the book. And more or less, the majority of people um, wanted me to tidy up their language, to make it more standard, more Queen's English. And I eventually convinced them that their, their language was beautiful. And he was a case in point. So he was a young man who uh, left as a teenager and his elder brother was here already in the UK. And before arriving, he asked his brother what he should be aware of. What, what advice did he have for him? And um, in Jamaica, it must be said that there are lots of dogs around, uh, but dogs aren't, they're not really pets. Uh, they're used to guard houses. They're used to scare people off. And sometimes children will be encouraged to, to tease the dogs in order to make them more vengeful, more angry. Um, and that's common. So when he's coming to the UK, he asks his brother what advice he would give him. And his brother says to him, whatever you do, don't beat the English people's dogs. You can beat the children, but don't beat the dogs. That's one thing that I was struck by. And the other thing was that he talked about the, the lights and the sky, I seem to remember, how um, in Jamaica, the sky is way up above your head, far away. But when he came to Britain, he, he felt he could just jump up and touch the sky. And everything was kind of gray and, and forbidding and, and rather uh, enclosed. And he talked about the, the difficulty he, he had of finding food that he could find palatable because the food is very bland. And in, in Jamaica, they use many, many spices and herbs. Um, and back in the 60s, there weren't so many available. And he said that um, he would put mustard on almost everything he ate, just to give a bit of spice, a bit of heat. Um, but also he was very funny about how um, uh, he would uh, avoid the teddy boys who were around at the time. Um, one of the things that struck me was the, the degree to which people in this country who were unfamiliar with the Caribbean didn't realize the differences between a man from St. Kitts and a man from Antigua and a man from Jamaica. And Bert Williams talked about the fact that sometimes the Jamaicans had a bit of a bad reputation. They were perceived to be a bit shirty or a bit aggressive. Um, 
And sometimes the other islanders were a bit embarrassed about the fact that they were lumped together. They didn't want to be considered Jamaican until the time of the Notting Hill riots, when the Teddy Boys and all the other um, races were targeting black people indiscriminately. And many of the Jamaicans who didn't live in Notting Hill heard about what was going on and they would come from Brixton or they come from East London. And again and again, people like Waveney Bushell and um, Joyce Estelle Trotman would say, thank God for the Jamaicans because uh, they would trade blows for blows with the, with the uh, bother boys or the, the uh, skinheads or whatever, whatever the, and, and the antagonist person was going to be, they wouldn't um, back down. Um, and in a way, um, Bert was like that. He had a lot of front. And sometimes I think that's what gets you through life, is to sort of show a bit of uh, fearlessness, even if you may be trembling inside. And he spoke a lot of times, but he'd be quavering in his boots, but he gave the impression of being unintimidated. I mean, I do, let's say, I, I absolutely love Bert's bits in this book. Um, he's very articulate and, and, he, and, he, and he speaks beautifully. Um, you talked about that um, poetic turn and um, I do love being pushed to another book from the book you're reading. Um, and um, because of your book, um, you've encouraged me to read uh, The Lonely Londoners um, by Sam Selvon, which is written in this really charming vernacular. And, and it took me a while to, to get with it. And then when you do, it's a revelation. Do you just want to touch on that for us? Yes, well, uh, that book was written in, in the mid 1950s. And um, it's, as you say, Vicky, it's, it's written in the, the vernacular or the dialect. In Jamaica, we say it's written in nation language. And um, there's a kind of uh, poetry just in the mundane, everyday things that are being said. I mean, when my father spoke and said, pass me the, the, the salt and pepper, I thought it was most, you know, the most profound thing I was being asked because he said it in this way, uh, because uh, I think that the the voice, uh, the Caribbean voice, has a lot of kind of character to it. So in a way, um, they are they might be perceived as being overly dramatic, but that's just a kind of flourish uh, and flair. Um, and again, um, they were steeped in in the English language. A lot of the words which they're using were old English language. So. If you are upset about something, you might say, oh, it's stuck in my craw, craw is throat, but it's an old English word for, for, for throat. And, and if you are really upset, you say, uh, she's vexed my spirit, she vexed my spirit, you know, she, she's vexed. And that's an old English. So what I was learning was, you know, a lot of times old English language that hadn't been maintained by the host population, as it were. Perhaps to go back, one of the other things that comes out is this kind of quest for respectability yes. and in a sense of there is more that there is more that binds us than than, than splits us apart um, for me there were things that made me laugh in this because i had a 1970s childhood in a working class family on the south coast of, of england and we also had a front room that we had for best and didn't go into and actually, one of the joys of this has got to be the West Indian front room. So could you just explain that for us? Yes. Um, so one of the, uh, the tropes of the book is about at what stage you accept that you're here to stay. Many of the people who came, came with a kind of vague plan that they would, in Jamaican parlance, they would work some money. And that means that they would save and prosper. And the idea, if it ever was an idea, was that it'd be maybe five years. After five years, they would have enough money to go back to the Caribbean. But the five years becomes 10, the 10 becomes 15. And one day we woke up as children and saw our parents changing the wallpaper. And then we knew we were here to stay. And at that point, I think there's a change in the mindset of the Caribbean migrants, that they're going to invest more in their home because their home is no longer in the Caribbean, the home is in Brixton, is in High Wycombe, is in Luton. And they're going to furnish their home with items which show that they've made a success of their lives. 
And what's really weird and wonderful is that they all seem to have the same aesthetic. So the West Indian front room was like a, a Victorian parlor, but they're all the same kind of things. There would be a drinks trolley um, with rum and uh, whiskies and, and vodkas and uh, little miniature glasses that never seemed to be used. Um, there would be uh, heavy patterned wallpaper. There would be a, a, a bowl of plastic fruit. Uh, there would be these little statues of um, Bambi. Um, um, there would be doilies everywhere. Um, and there would be ice buckets in the shape of a, a pineapple. Um, and there's a man called Michael McMillan who's made a wonderful exhibition called The West Indian Front Room which uh, speaks to the idea of um, it being a symbol of your acceptance of where you've now arrived, but also of your investment in, in your future. But as you said, Vicky, similar to your background, when I was growing up, we weren't allowed in the front room. The front room was for big people. And so much so that um, there was actually in our house, there was an adjoining door to the dining room or the, the back room, we called it. Um, and there would be a handle that you know you could pull down a handle to go into the front room. But my father took off both handles and took off the bolt that linked the handles so that you couldn't get into the front room. So we used to get uh, the back of forks, the end of forks or the end of a knife and, and use that to go into the lock and turn the handle and get into the front room. But lo and behold, if we were ever found in the front room or if there are any traces of being in the front room, there would be hell to pay. Yeah, but the, the front room is very special. Um, and uh, it also speaks to both the possibilities of entering modernity, but also slowly so. So for instance, uh, also in the front room, we'd have these, these quite scary looking paraffin heaters, which smelled awful, but they, you know, but they looked the part. They looked like they were of some great substance, but they were a very cheap way of getting, getting warm. Colin, the time has whizzed past and it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, you were the, to be the finale of the um, Derby Book Festival actual program. Um, we absolutely are committed to having you up to Derby. It would be remiss on us to leave this point without discussing the two people who were going to join you um, at that event. And I wonder if we can just touch on, on their lives. And I'd, love to do that. I'd love to do that. So the two people we'd like to introduce into the discussion um, a young man called Christian Cassil, who's a young photographer in his mid-twenties, and an older photographer called Howard Gray. Now Howard Gray, it transpires, and on the back of your shelf there's a book, isn't it Vicky, of this. Uh, Howard Gray is a photographer who uh, is now in his uh, late 70s, who took this photograph, the photograph on the cover of Homecoming, and the photograph was taken in 1962, May 1962. Now I know this through this young man, Christian Cassil. So towards the end of the process of um, composing this book through these interviews, I suddenly thought it'd be great to have some photographs of the people that I've interviewed. So we recruited a young photographer, um, Christian Cassil, um, who's 27, to go and photograph all of the contributors. By that time, we already had the proof copy of the book with this photograph. And he saw this photograph and he said, oh, I know that photograph. Christian Cassil, the young man, had been mentored by Howard Gray. And um, through that connection, I was able to meet Howard Gray. And he told me the story of that image. And it's a very powerful story. So it was May 1962 when Howard Gray turned on the radio and he heard that there was the last boat train of Caribbean people arriving on a ship to Southampton and then the boat train would take them from Southampton to Waterloo. So Howard Gray was determined to get to Waterloo. He was a young photographer, he was 20 years old and he um, never used flash photography. He come from a long line of photographers in his family, but they never used flash photography, flash photography for uh, aesthetic reasons. He got to Waterloo Station. It was a very grey day, very grey May day. Uh, the ceiling 
the roof of Waterloo Station was very grimy and dirty because it still had the camouflage, remem remnants of the camouflage from the disguise, disguise of the Second World War to stop the, Berman, the Germans dropping bombs. The walls were very grimy. The uh, floor was asphalt and very black. And the people coming off the boat train were very dark, dark skinned. And Howard Gray took three rolls of film very quickly, within 20 minutes, snapped away, went back to his uh, house, to his apartment to process the film, to develop the film. He looked at the negatives and there was nothing there. It was a blank. He cut up the negatives, put them in a manila envelope and there they remained for 54 years. And then a few years ago, Howard Gray, who's now 77, was watching a BBC television program called Click, which is a technology program that explored how you can now visualize uh, data. So the things that are invisible to the human eye that are still there, the data's there, the raw data's there, but you can visualize that data with these new high-end scanners. So you took, this negative to the scanners and they scanned three times for shade and shadows and negatives came up. The negatives came up very slowly. The, the images evolved from the darkness and 37 images, all as striking as this one, emerged. And I love that story because in a way it's a metaphor for the Caribbean experience in Britain. In a way, the people of the Windows generation, my parents' generation, have been in the margins, not really regarded, almost invisible. And slowly through the passage of time, they've come to the center, they've come to the fore. And I felt so honored to be able to add to that process of making large their lives, making manifest the lives that they've lived to show that they're part of the infrastructure of our country and culture. Colin, you have shared the most wonderful stories, um, both with us today and in this book. I can't be more committed to getting you and Howard and Christian on a stage together and presenting them at Derby. So let me just say thank you. And we all desperately hope to see you really soon. Thank you. Thank you. I'd really love to come up very soon, as soon as I can. Thank you.